And we are pleased to welcome, through the latest stop on a big swing through Cape Breton during the last week of June, Nova Scotia's Premier makes his debut here at Talil Community <laughs> Television. Tim Houston is here. Premier Houston, thank you for joining me today. Happy to be here. Happy to make my debut here on, on site, for sure. Well, it's a pleasure to have you here at our Arishat Studios. And you are just literally minutes before we sat down here, coming from Strait of Cancel yeah. Superport Days at the Dundee Resort. And that's where you were giving the lunchtime keynote address. What was the atmosphere like there for you, and uh, how did you feel as you were letting people know what was going on? Yeah, so first off, happy, always happy to be in the, in the area, and Dundee Resort is an amazing, amazing uh, venue for uh, an event like that. It was a full house. The energy is incredible. There, there's so much going on in this region, so much potential for our province in general in the energy space, in the green hydrogen space, and, and a lot of it's being led right, from, right from, from this area of the province. So the energy was high, actually. It was great. It was a great crowd. Now, I want to pick up with you about green hydrogen and green ammonia because we are at a point now where we have two companies that have received environmental assessment to get going in western Richmond County, Bearhead Energy and Everwind Fuels, Port Hawkesbury Paper also getting approval for a smaller green hydrogen development in the same area. Your government closed several loopholes and filled in several blanks in existing legislation to make it easier for green hydrogen to set up on an individual basis over the course of the fall. Can you tell me a little bit about why that was a priority and why you've mentioned the straight area so much in terms of looking at green hydrogen? Yeah, just the potential is so great. I mean, if you think about the uh, the wind speeds we have here, world-class wind speeds, uh, offshore wind speeds, onshore wind speeds, um, the province in general, the tidal potential we have is just, it's just remarkable. There's so many jurisdictions that are envious of what we have. And we have it right here, um, so we need to we need to act on that that opportunity. So our government is, you know, we, we're we're a government that's very focused on action. We want to move things forward uh, in in a responsible way for sure. But uh, I find a lot of times uh, governments are, you know, they 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 don't want to say yes, but they don't want to say no. So they say maybe, and maybe in government speak means more studies, more studies, more, you know. So so we we want to get to the yes or get to the no. You know, some projects are appropriate and some aren't. So let's get to yes or let's get to no. So we're moving quick and we have so many partners here. You know, the municipality has been great, uh, real, showing real leadership on, on that file. We like to work with those who, who, are, who also have, you know, showing interest in, in moving their own community forward. We, help, we like to help them and work with them. So we're finding that in this region, but the potential is so great. It's the time for this province is right now to act on these things. And the world is looking for green energy and we can be providing it to them, so we should. Now talking about local leadership, mm. the last time I got to interview you was almost mm. three years ago actually, on the deck of the St. Peter's Marina. You were relatively new to the position. You had become the PC party leader in 2018. You were with the newly minted candidate for I Richmond was, at yeah. the time, Trevor Woodrow. He of course is now nearing his second anniversary <laughs> as being the Richmond MLA. What has it been like working with him and having him in caucus? Look, we have a, we have a great team uh, across the province, but uh, Trevor Boudreau is uh, the leader Leadership that he shows at the at the caucus table, he represents this community so well. And you're right, I was a new newly uh, elected leader at that time. And actually, as we as we started to plan and prepare for that provincial election that ultimately came in 2021, Trevor Boudreau was the first candidate elected under as me as a new leader. So we have a have a special special bond. But uh, look, he's a great person. He cares about the community and uh, puts a lot in uh, to represent in the community. And and comes to Halifax, and when he comes to Halifax, we, we listen to him. Mm -hmm. I listen carefully to what he has to say on the issues because I know he's, 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 he's sharing what he's hearing from people, uh, and that's, that's, what, that's what government can never lose sight. Politics is about people, uh, and, and Trevor's a great representative. He really is. Now, as you mentioned, we're coming on the two-year anniversary of not only the election of Trevor Boudreaux, but of course the election of yourself as the Premier and the PC party as the government party. As we head towards the midway point of this first term for you, I'm just wondering how do you feel in terms of the party's performance and your own performance as Premier? Are you where you want to be right now? Yeah, so two years, eh, already? Yep. <laughs> but uh, look, I think, you know, um, I'm an impatient person by nature we always want more we always want to go faster uh, Nova Scotians have a right to expect uh, a sense of urgency from their government so we move we're moving quickly but the challenges that we face in this in this province are, are real in healthcare, care uh, for sure 
Uh, I, do, I do believe, uh, I'm, I guess I'm optimistic when I talk to many healthcare workers I talk to are, they're hopeful and they're optimistic and they can see that, you know, it takes time, but it's, it's coming. So, you know, we're very focused on healthcare for sure. We'll continue to be focused on that. There's a lot more work to be, do, but, uh, to be done, but I do feel like we're, we're, we're moving the needle. So that, that's good. Uh, but the, the province is growing. The population is growing at an incredible, uh, incredible pace. I mean, we had the year-over-year -year numbers, uh, 37,000 new Nova Scotians. That's incredible. We would normally grow by about 5,000 people. So when you think about that type of growth, uh, even, in, even in the last 18 months, uh, 50,000 new Nova Scotians. 50,000 in 18 months. That's like adding a Sydney and a Truro and a Wolfville all in that amount of time. So uh, this is good. Uh, uh, people drive economies, people create opportunities, so the growth is good. It's not without its challenges. Challenges in, in housing, as we said, challenges in healthcare as well. But, uh, but I think what, uh, what I would say overall, uh, uh, two, years, two years into this term, um, just as a Nova Scotian, I'm proud of uh, the potential of this province and I'm proud of the fact that we're acting on that potential in so many ways. It's a great province. It's an incredible province. There's a lot good happening. There are challenges for sure, but there is a lot good happening in this province. Now, I want to pick up on health care <laughs> for a couple of reasons. You made that the centerpiece of your 2021 election campaign. It's still been a centerpiece of the way that you and your government have proceeded since being elected in August of 2021. This morning, you and MLA Boudreau got the chance to give, get a little visit to the Straight Richmond Hospital yeah. in Evanston. That's been a spot that has had its struggles, that has its struggles keeping the ER open. A year ago, it was not only facing doctor vacancies, but also nursing vacancies. Your government set up an Office of Healthcare Professional Recruitment to try to fill these gaps. How do you feel that that process is going and what did you think of what you saw at the Straight Richmond? Well, I was happy to be there today. It's a great facility and the people working there are, are dedicated to, um, to, to providing good health care. Uh, we, we really have good people working in the health care system in, the, in this province and certainly at, at that hospital 100%. So we know that there's human resource uh, challenges for sure. I think that the biggest step we've taken is just in this session of the legislature, we passed the Patient Access to Care Act. This is a very, very significant piece of uh, legislation. I think in the fullness of time, you know, 10 years, but maybe five years, maybe less, uh, people will look back at that piece of legislation and say, wow, that changed the delivery of healthcare, not only in Nova Scotia, but in Canada, it, it really will. And it's focused on common sense credentialing. So if we have healthcare professionals in, you know, maybe in the UK or, you know, in the States or another part of the world, good, good enough for them, good enough for Nova Scotia. We don't have to make them jump through a number of hurdles and a number of exams. Let's look at their experience, let's look at their training, and let's get them credentialed here where, where appropriate. And this one act is changing things. Uh, the Nurses College in particular, they've shown tremendous leadership on this file, but they identified a few countries where the training is, 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 is as good as ours, in some cases exceed, exceeds ours, but it certainly as good, we can't lower that standard of care. Uh, and since that act came through, um, they had 10,000 uh, nurses, I think it's up to 13,000 nurses from other countries apply and say, we want to be part of the solution in Nova Scotia. So, you know, these things, we'll, we'll, we'll go through those applications, we'll be able to fill a lot of vacancies, we're doing the same uh, for doctors, we'll do it for physiotherapists, pharmacists, all, there, we have vacancies across the board, but this act, is it's it's a moment uh, in time that we will remember as changing healthcare in this province. I feel very confident in that. Uh, so there's uh, there's help for all those healthcare professionals out there. Help is on the way. Uh, thank you for for everything you've done to 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 keep the system going. We know it's been stressful, but uh, I feel very strongly that that help is on the way, and Nova Scotians can feel confident uh, that they'll be able to access the care they need, uh, where they need it, and when they need it. Now, I wanted to pick up on one other initiative that your Minister of Health and Wellness, Michelle Thompson, introduced in mid-June, specifically an incentive program for doctors that are currently practicing in Nova Scotia, that if they take on another 50 patients to their patient load, they'll get a financial assistance of $10,000 plus another $200 for each new patient brought in after that 50 is met. Sometimes patient loads, especially in rural areas, are toppling to the point where we're seeing some people in the eastern region having patients loads that go as high as 3,000, triple the provincial average. 
what do you say to them in terms of whether ten thousand dollars and then two hundred dollars per patient after fifty is going to inspire them to take on more patients? Well, it's, it's probably that's not the person we want to take on more patients. Uh, like you know, we we need to we need to find the balance where there is capacity, where there are those uh, physicians who have capacity. This is an incentive for them to maybe maybe do a little more. Uh, maybe this is a physician who's been working part time. Maybe it's a physician who you know has more time. Says, "Well, look, maybe I will take some more patients on." Maybe it's somebody who has a you know has the capacity in their practice, and we'll work with them on the capacity side. So, if we add a nurse to the practice, will that help you uh, you know provide better care, more care to more Nova Scotians? If we add another type of healthcare professional to you, if we help with some of your admin, these are discussions that are happening, and I'm very pleased with the the progress of discussions with uh, Doctor Doctors Nova Scotia. But the end of the day, it's it, this. Is a, this is a uh, you know the fix to healthcare is is there's many many parts to it. There's not one fix. There's many parts to it. So we're we're focused on the many hands aspect. So the bill that I talked about, the patient access to access to care, the common sense credentialing, also deals with scope of practice. So people will be familiar with pharmacists being able to do more things. So the pharmacy clinics that we've opened up around the province are an access point for certain people for certain ailments. Go to the pharmacy. You know, there's been over 5,000 strep tests done in those pharmacies just in the last couple months. I know where those 5,000 people would have went. They would have went to the emergency mm -hmm. department. So it's all about sharing the load and getting, you know, getting people the ability to work to their full scope of practice. And, and I'll tell you, the, uh, the healthcare leadership team, healthcare professionals, they, they, they stop me and they tell me. They say the patient access to care bill making a difference. The pharmacy clinics making a difference. The mobile care, cl uh, care clinic that goes around the province and, and shows up in certain communities making a difference. Virtual care making a difference. Not for everything, but it's, it's making a difference. And it, that is also attached to, to clinics around the province. So if people use the virtual care system to access care, Many times, somebody on the other end will say, look, I think you need to see somebody in person. And then we can refer them to one of our, our clinics and get them in on a pretty, pretty timely basis, right? So, so there's many parts to this. And I, and I think, you know, as we continue to move these forward, many of them were pilot projects, we'll expand them. More, there'll be more pharmacies. There'll be more mobile clinics. There'll be more healthcare professionals that want to come and practice here in this province. But, but the incentive program is just at a point in time. And it's just, you know, that's from, you know, working with Doctors Nova Scotia and saying, if we did this, would this be useful? And for some people, it will be. And there will be some patients that go, on, go off the list and get attached to a doctor because of it. Not all of them, but some will. And there'll be some doctors who just say, I can't, I can't take on anymore. And that's okay, too. All right, we'll hope for the best there. Uh, let's shift gears for a moment, Premier Houston, if I could. We started this conversation talking about green hydrogen and green ammonia, and renewable energy seems to be as much of a hallmark of your government as healthcare reform appears to be, partly because of the measures that you and your Minister of Natural Resources and Renewables, Tory Rushton, have taken, as I said earlier, to clean up the loopholes in existing mm. legislation involving green hydrogen, but also in terms of the approach to such federal moves as carbon pricing taking mm. effect on July the 1st, and as well with the Atlantic Loop project. Yeah. I'd like to begin with carbon pricing, if I could. Your government has repeatedly said that it would rather go with what you describe as being better than a carbon tax. That's mm -hmm. been the catchphrase. Mm -hmm. You've suggested that renewable energy that's already in effect in Nova Scotia and taking effect would do more to be able to assist with the battle against climate change than carbon pricing. Can you give me a sense on what you feel Nova Scotia can do to help in this regard and why you feel that's better than carbon tax? Yeah, so look, we, we, the, our climate is changing. There's no question about that. Our climate is definitely changing. Uh, we see it, you know, in what's happening around. And uh, so we agree with the federal government on that. Um, and there's a role for government in, in preparing and, and taking steps to, you know, preserve the planet. We agree with the federal government on that. Now, the place where we disagree is how you do that. So the federal government thinks that you can do it by uh, putting a carbon tax on, on, on Nova Scotians and on uh, Canadians. And I'll tell you, this, this carbon tax is very... Punitive. This is penalizing Nova Scotians. It's going to hurt a lot. The increase in the price of gas, the increase in the, in the price of diesel, home heating oil, the increase in the price of everything, you know, that has to get moved and transported around. We're going to see it at the cash register. So it will cost Nova Scotians a lot of money. And I don't see the upside to the uh, preserving the planet side because we're a rural province. We have to drive to work. You know, there's very few places in this province where they have the opportunity to say, well, let me jump on public transit. 
you know, very few places where they can say, well, maybe I'll bike to work. Maybe I'll bike to, to take the kids to hockey practice. Maybe I'll, these things, they're just not options. They're just not reality for us. So, so a carbon tax is designed to modify behavior, to get somebody to do less of something. You see that with taxes on things like alcohol and, and, and smokes and stuff, right? Maybe if we put the taxes on, they'll do less of it. So that's what a carbon tax is meant to modify behavior, but we can't. We can't modify our behavior. We have to drive, we have to heat our homes. So therefore, it won't do anything to preserve the planet. Meanwhile, we went to the federal government and say, we, here's an idea. Let's actually focus on steps that are meaningful. Support us while we unlock the potential of offshore wind. Support us while we unlock the potential of green hydrogen. Support us as we uh, focus on tidal energy. Uh, and, and they said, no, we're not going to support you on those things. We want a carbon tax. And I don't get it. It's punitive to Nova Scotians. It's unfair to Nova Scotians. And it doesn't get you to where you need to get to. So I, I, I just... Uh, I, I was so hopeful that we could talk to the federal government, talk some common sense into them, um, but it, it wasn't possible. And Nova Scotians will be penalized by a carbon tax, and there's no, there's no good reason why. Now, I just wonder, do you <clears throat> regret at all the <clears throat> timing of your government's responses to carbon pricing? And by that, <clears throat> I mean your government first offered this better than a carbon tax package to the federal government less than a week before the August 31st, 2022 mm -hmm. deadline to submit a new proposal. The following spring, i.e. what we're just coming out of right now, mm -hmm. you and the other two Atlantic mm -hmm. PC premiers, Mr. Higgs from New Brunswick, Mr. King from PEI, stated that you wanted an emergency meeting. You made mm -hmm. one last pitch for an emergency meeting with the federal government just a week ago. Some might say, to use a hockey analogy, mm -hmm. that your government has basically pulled the goalie and is trying to score a goal to tie the game with five seconds left. How do you respond to that? Look, we, we put forward a plan. The plan was the culmination of a number of discussions. I, was actually, I actually thought that they would see how good that plan was and actually have an adult discussion about it. I actually believed that that was what the next step would be. Um, I, 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 I still can't believe how fixated uh, the federal government has been on just taxing people. Uh, but but it, just, it just doesn't make any sense to me. So, look, we put forward a plan. The reality is there was no, the Liberals were committed to a carbon tax. It wouldn't have mattered if, uh, it wouldn't have mattered who presented an alternative, when they presented it. It just wouldn't have mattered. They're fixated on a carbon tax and, and Nova Scotians, Canadians, uh, will pay the price for that. And, and, and there's so much opportunity, and, I, and I think about this, in a country like Canada, uh, with all of our coastlines, in this, in this great, wonderful country, we have a amount of coastline, we have the amount of potential we have offshore, we don't have any offshore wind. Not, not, not one little bit of it, right? How is that, when you have a federal government that talks so much about the climate and the environment and green energy, how is it that there's no uh, offshore wind in this country at all? That is sad, and that's embarrassing. Um, because they've just focused so much on, on, on the carbon tax as a, as a, as a solution, and it's not uh, the only solution. Uh, it's certainly not a good solution for Nova Scotia. Now, I just <coughs> want to make a lateral move here. Uh, the federal government has actually proposed <coughs> rebates to those impacted by the <coughs> carbon tax. Nova Scotians will pay the highest carbon tax in the country. <coughs> Does your government look at anything like, for example, freezing the provincial percentage of gasoline or diesel does it look at providing any kind of rebates or assistance at the provincial level for Nova Scotians impact? So our higher? government has been very focused on affordability. We, we've taken a number of uh, steps to try to make life more affordable for Nova Scotians. <clears throat> we'll continue to do that. Home heating rebate, you know, seniors care grant, child care. We, we, we've focused on affordability in every way we can. But right now, uh, with the carbon tax, which is unnecessary and not helpful, uh, so now if we take a, a step to try and reduce the impact of that, well, that's, that means that I'm reducing my investment in healthcare. I'm reducing my investment in seniors. I'm reducing my investment in roads. I'm reducing, and I'm doing that to send money to what, to Ottawa? How about Ottawa just not put the carbon tax on so we can continue to invest in healthcare, continue to invest in roads, continue to invest in seniors? So I don't, uh, look, we'll do what we can to make more life more affordable for, for Nova Scotians. We'll continue to take steps in that, in that regard. But, but, for, but for, the, uh, for, for the Liberal government to force this tax on Nova Scotians and then say, well, take, it, take the money out of another pocket, they're asking us to reduce our spending in healthcare. And I think that's unfair and unnecessary.
Now another bone of contention between your government and the federal government concerning energy delivery and renewable energy comes courtesy of the discussions around the Atlantic Loop, which would provide hydroelectric power from Quebec and Labrador to Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, as well as Newfoundland and Labrador. Ottawa confirmed earlier this spring, the infrastructure minister, Dominic LeBlanc, confirmed $4.5 billion towards a $6.8 billion price tag to get the Atlantic Loop up and running. You and your government have stated that's not enough. Your Minister of Natural Resources and Renewables, Tory Rushton, saying Ottawa should be providing more. Why do you feel that this isn't, at the current time, a good deal for Nova Scotia and what can be done to improve it? Yeah, so we, we've, we've taken very direct action. We've legislated climate goals. We're really serious about, you know, um, greening our grid. We're really serious about our environment. We put them in legislation. Not many other jurisdictions have done that. So as we look to our, our goals for 2030 and beyond, the Atlantic Loop is, is, is an option. It's, it's a potential pathway to get towards our goals. Uh, but it can only be a reasonable pathway if it's affordable and makes sense uh, for Nova Scotians. So, and if it's not affordable and doesn't make sense, then we have to find another path. And there are other paths. We can achieve our goals without the loop, but in some ways the, the loop might make it easier if the price was right. The price is not right. Uh, so the federal government has, has talked about a, a $4.5 billion amount. That sounds like a big number. Uh, but when you lay, lay that alongside of, of an overall cost of $6.8 billion or, or $7.5, uh, not so big anymore. And also, it's a loan, so it has to be paid back. So here's my concerns with it. So uh, number one, um, the, the utility has told us that at the deal that is on the table from the federal government, power rates would double. Well, I don't accept that. I'm not going to sign on to something that will double the power rates of Nova Scotians. That's, that's number one. Uh, number two is the, the cost, $6.8 billion, $7.5 billion, whatever. Uh, show me a major mega infrastructure project that hasn't gone over budget by 50% or 100%. We have our own experience here with Muskrat Falls. So what happens if that goes to $10 billion? This could, this could bankrupt our province at the terms that they have on the table. Well, I don't accept that. I'm not going to risk that, uh, our, the financial future of the province. So the numbers don't work um, uh, for, for our province uh, with what's on the table. If the numbers were to work, then we're interested in them, but they don't work. Uh, so that means we have to go another route. That means we'll, we'll achieve our goals uh, without the Atlantic Loop if it's necessary. Uh, to do it without the Atlantic Loop. And we'll do that by adding more wind. We'll do that by more solar. The, uh, we'll do that by adding more hydro. We'll do that by made in Nova Scotia solutions. And by the way, all of these things give us more control of our, our destiny. Because the Atlantic Loop, is we're only talking about the cost to build it. Then we have to talk about the price that Quebec may charge us for the energy. Uh, and that is a, you know, that could be, that's a whole nother discussion, right? Yeah. A lot is outside of our control on the Atlantic Loop. Uh, and if the numbers don't work, I'm not going to force it. Uh, I would rather go with made in Nova Scotia solutions that would put more in our control and give us more control over the destiny of our, of our, of our great province. So, uh, so, so one last question on this quickly, sure. Premier, and that's the idea <clears throat> that sometimes these issues get tangled up. You've talked about a concern that power rates could go up. Your government introduced legislation this past October that put a 1.8% cap on power rate increases by Nova Scotia Power over the following two years. Shortly afterwards, the CEO of Nova Scotia Power's parent company, Amira, Scott Balfour, announced that the company would be backing away from the Atlantic Loop as a result. Is there any leeway for your government and for you personally to lobby for Nova Scotia Power to rejoin the Atlantic Loop process? Would that help make things oh, easier? Oh, I, I think I remember he said that, uh, but you know, they, they, they're still at the table. We're still talking to the federal government. They're talking to the, the federal government. New Brunswick uh, Power is talking to the federal government. We're, look, we're, 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 we're a government that listens. Uh, we're, we want to have adult discussions on these topics, and, but, but, but there's, there's are certain things we just can't do. And we just can't sign on to a deal that doubles the power rates for, for Nova Scotians. It's, 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 not a good thing to, it's not a good thing to do, and I won't do it. So um, there's lots of precedent where the federal government could do more. Look at Newfoundland. They, they paid almost $5 billion to support the rate payers of Newfoundland. So these are the types of discussions we'll continue to have with the federal government. But w w what is on offer right now, although it sounds like a big number, 4.5 billion, it's not a, it's not, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a number 
that would uh, protect Nova Scotians. One last question for you, Premier, and this is not necessarily about numbers, although there's a number involved. This is about the fixed election day legislation that you and your government introduced shortly after being elected, and you wanted to bring an end to instability in terms of a government being able to call a vote literally any time. Now, that being said, the date that was set for the next provincial election was August 21st, 2025, literally four years from the previous one in 2021. Are you worried at all that having an election in the latter stages of summer could disengage people who might normally be looking at the candidates and their platforms and their policies? Any concern there? No, no, no there's not. Um, look, um, this was one of the last jurisdictions to have a fixed election date. Every, every government, uh, certainly in, in, the, in the 10 years that I've been in the legislature and, and, and governments way before that, they all campaigned on having a fixed election date and then got in government and thought, maybe, maybe a fixed election date, not so good. Mm -hmm. Maybe I like to keep that, those cards a little closer to my chest. Yeah. We're the first government that said, no, we, we, we'll, we, we're going to have a fixed election date. So we've done that. Um, so now the, the date is it's, it's four years after the election. Nova Scotians like to have their say on how they're governed and they like to do it in, 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 in four-year increments. That, that, that's, that's the way it is. So our job as, as elected officials is to keep people engaged. And that means, you know, I, I think you, do, you, you can keep people engaged by doing what you say. Uh, you know, we, we campaigned on a number of things and we're focused on those things. We're, we're doing what we said. I, I believe very, very firmly we're doing what we said we would do. In some instances where what we said we do is just not going to work, then we're sticking our hand up in the air and saying, can't do that. People may remember my idea to have a non-resident tax on people, right? If famously, uh, yeah, famously, we remember that one. Famously, yes. uh, we, you know, we we said we were going to do that. We campaigned on that. We did it. Started to do it, and then we we Nova Scotia said, "Don't do it." So we we so we we said we're not going to do that. We we had the courage to change course on that. So by doing what you say, I think you can keep people engaged in the political process and just being a good good MLA and being being and connected to the community like like Trevor is here like you know, MLAs across the province being that voice for people that's how people get engaged uh, they'll go they'll go and vote uh, when they're engaged and it's our job to keep them engaged and that's a good spot to end it so I want to thank you Premier Houston for giving me a couple of minutes here in the middle of a busy sprint <laughs> through Cape Breton Island it's a pleasure to have you here at Hill Community Television today happy to do it thanks for having me Very All appreciate right. it Tim Houston is the Premier of Nova Scotia. We've been speaking to him here at the Talil Community Television Studios in Arishat.